the blood is going here. You know, it starts as a war movie and you're, and you're led into it in that way and then slowly it just starts to shift. And then it goes off. It goes off. Our movie takes a little twist. And then it just keeps getting stranger. What is this shit? It's an unusual script. Does somebody want to tell me what the fuck is going on here? It sort of leads you down a path and then it throws that all out the window. You're kind of going along, think you're in your war movie and then... Bang. And you kind of go, oh, oh. I was blown away when I finally read the script. I was like, what? <laughs> what is going on? You're like, wow, okay, it's not quite the World War II film that you thought <laughs> I was expecting. The Thousand Year Reich. These Thousand Year Soldiers. Monster movies are great and, and best when you believe the situation, you believe the characters, you're truly invested, uh, and you get something that is rationally impossible, clearly extreme, clearly horrific and freaky and, and, and bizarre. And I just thought the opportunity of saying, we're gonna spend nearly the first half of this movie just getting to know these you know, young men who are going into war and we're going to little by little take you into a place where you're suddenly in these, the depths of a terrifying clearly genre movie, but hopefully because you love the characters, because you relate to them, you believe the world, you believe the situation, and it's that much scarier. <laughs> and the thing about a war story, it's almost like the table has been set. The horrors of war are already there. And so what's weird is that, you know, you suddenly get into this sort of, you know, freakish sort of fantasy horror level, and it doesn't feel like that much of a stretch. The action means nothing if we don't have the characters and and the drama to, to make anybody care about what's going on. For me, all story starts with characters, so you kind of build out from that. And whenever I first started here, it was finding the voices of those characters. And then once you have strong characters and strong relationships, it doesn't, I feel like you can put them in any world. Boys, just put the whole fucking mission at risk. Go get Tibbet and Chase. In terms of the actual locations, I think the one that caused Harriet, the location manager, the most grey hairs, was this back of church location. The entrance to it, the entrance to the underworld. Where do you find a tunnel that is in a rural environment that is not surrounded by lights and noisy roads, that is big enough to fit a large World War truck? And ultimately, we kind of homed in on, or Harriet homed in on, railway tunnels, or disused railway tunnels, to give that arch and the cuttings and what have you. Pretty quickly, the Bluebell Railway uh, location sort of rose to the top of the pile. It's a bit that, frankly, is forgotten about, but for us, it made a, an excellent rear of church entrance, steep side, wooded. Three, two, one. This is where they had Jacob. The Underworld was the big ticket item in our production design, and it was always going to be the thing that we thought would be the most memorable, and so we wanted to spend the most time on it, and we really wanted it to have a layered look and tell a story of its own. So our idea was that this church had been there for a long time, built on this site where this tar was oozing up out of the ground and that it would go back centuries. Maybe originally Celtic ruins are there and the church was built on top of that and over the years had been appropriated by different groups in this area. And then of course, in the present of the movie, the Nazis have taken it over and built their lab there. The first time I went to see the laboratory set, all the detail was just so perfect. Everything was just so absolutely amazing. You just literally have to be here and do your line and do your best because you've got already that which is wow well i'm gonna try to be in the same level this is all carved polystyrene treated and painted as stone magic of the movies the nazis have created this little bunker area so there's all this shuttered concrete is of course only plaster then we come through into the corridor here and then we come into what is the tower room our main character ford comes along with his explosives and this takes us into the main upper laboratory. John, our designer, came up with this idea of having them all hanging in bags so you never quite see what's in there. 
to start with, you just see all these weird, horrible hanging creature things. But all the stone is just like polystyrene, just like a, a foam finish. Everything is, that's, that's plastic. This is all made lightweight, foam. We're moving down into the reanimation area. We've got this poor young lady here who's got nothing left of her apart from a head. It's prosthetic guys who are quite brilliant have created these floating limbs. Pretty gruesome. All the construction team have been quite brilliant on this. They've done a really great job and it feels spookily real. That's very good. You know, like everyone keeps saying, I'm lost when I walk through this. And that was kind of deliberate to try and create a world that you got lost in and was disorientating as well as claustrophobic. I've wandered around this set a couple of times when there's been nobody here. And, you know, it's, it's pretty scary and kind of confusing. You wanted a place where who knows what's through that door. It's something a little bit spooky. You never know what's coming around the corner. And also to have something which you can actually go inside of and you feel completely engrossed and you are encapsulated into this world. I think it always really helps. We've got a few areas in this particular set with green screen extensions, but it's very much a enclosed space, 360 space, where you can shoot anywhere and do whatever without huge visual effects extensions or cost. So put it all, all the money on screen straight away.